Hey, this is Jamie with Stowmeyer Games, and today in this Sunday sit-down video, I'm going to talk about my, not my top 10 favorite games, because I actually have not played all these games, but 10 games, maybe even 11, I just thought of one, that have eligibility requirements for a player to have a victory in the game. And so an example of that, just to give some context, because this is a, something that not a lot of games do, is that say in a game, you're playing a game with victory points, the player with the most victory points wins. This eligibility requirement would say that even if you have the most victory points, if you haven't done X, or if you have the least of X or the most of X, you are not eligible for the victory. Um, that's the general concept here. So it's something else that you have to keep track of or keep an eye on, uh, separate from whatever the win condition is for the game uh, to be eligible for that win. Most of the examples I'll talk about today are uh, competitive games, but there are there's one there's one cooperative game that I'll mention. There might be others that I haven't quite uh, thought of in this category because I mostly thought about it through the competitive lens. Um, and I'll yeah I'll just I'll do the list first, and then I have a few uh, things I wanted to discuss, like why why I think games do this, uh, and why I think it's pretty cool that games do this, and why I'm fascinated by it, especially recently. If you've seen some of my videos about a few of the games that I'm going to mention on this list right now. Um, so the first one on my list is one that I have not played. This is called Quo Vadis. And in Quo Vadis, uh, the, the eligibility requirement is that you must have a politician in the Senate by the end of the game. Um, I don't know a lot about this mechanism for this game. It was, someone mentioned it on Twitter. Uh, but it sounds like it's a thematic thing for the game that uh, just to be eligible for the victory... One of the things you have to do in the game, at some point in the game, is to somehow get a politician into the Senate, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, I can talk a little bit more in detail about QE, a game that I just played, a game that I also just did a video about. In QE, it is an auction game where you can bid any amount of money, um, which can create some really, really interesting, fun scenarios in the game. You're, you're writing down money on, on a little uh, whiteboard every time you place a bid. However... At the end of the game, the player who spent the most amount of money is not allowed to win the game. So even if that player has the most points, they are not allowed to win the game. So it keeps the players in check throughout the game uh, because they, they don't want to be the one to spend the most money out of all the other players. But like in our game, players spend millions of dollars during the game. One player just happened to spend more millions than the other players. So that created a really interesting scenario. It really, and because in QE you don't have full information, in fact, you have fairly limited information, the main information you have is whenever you bid, um, you will only know if someone outbid you. So if I bid $20 million on something and I still didn't win it, that means that someone else bid more than that. And it kind of lets me know that I'm safe to maybe have some higher bids, not not higher than 20, 20 million, but um, some some bids that are pretty pretty close to that, and still not be at risk for being the player who spent the most money throughout the game. Um, and one one last thing about QE, I, I talked about it more in detail in that recent video, but I like that it creates a. A, another thing to remember at the end of the game. Like, that was my first game of QE. I'm, I'm always going to remember it. I'm going to remember some little things about the game, like like who won. I actually won the game. But I'm also going to remember who spent the most money. So it creates two um, takeaway memorable moments, which I really, really like in games. Uh, the next one that, that I also just did a video about is High Society. High Society is a, a Reiner Knitte game, uh, another auction game. And similar to QE, uh, well, it's kind of like the opposite of QE, because in, in High Society, you are given a certain amount of money at the beginning of the game. And at the end of the game, if you have the least amount of money remaining, you are not eligible to win, even if you have the most points. And the reason for this in High Society th thematically is that uh, even if you've collected all these wonderful things throughout the game and you have them in your home, your beautiful home, but you're broke, you have no money, um, or you have less money than all the other members of, of the High Society, they are going to shun you. Which is unfortunate, but thematically, I think it works really well that uh, that you want to at least have some money at the end of the game um, for for thematic reasons to be part of the the high society. And that game also in high society it really does keep you again in, in check from just uh, bidding outlandishly um, often as often as possible to win certain things. It makes you it makes the decisions a lot tougher, especially for the things that you really want to win the bids on. Um, because because you don't want to spend all your money or, or spend more money than other players. 
And I actually, one, one thing as I say that, it, it creates an interesting passive interaction between the other players. It makes you pay attention to the other players and how much money they have left. You don't see what's in their hand, but you can see how many cards they have left in their hand um, to, to use, how many money cards they have left. So it gives you, I, I like that it gives you a reason to pay attention to the other players, especially if it's in comparison to them. The next one is another one that I just played at my recent game, game night, and that is Ponzi Scheme. In Ponzi Scheme, uh, the game end is triggered when someone goes bankrupt. When they, so in Ponzi Scheme, you're, you are basically taking loans to pay off other loans that you have. And you're doing this as long as possible. You're just like hanging on as long as possible and trying to acquire points while you're doing this. Um, and the game end is triggered when someone can't actually pay off one of their loans. And any players who uh, fit that description, because it happens at the same time, there's a phase in the game where you pay off your loans, and any players who go bankrupt during that phase are not eligible for endgame scoring. But beyond that, at least in the version of the game we played, uh, well, money doesn't matter very much at the end of the game. Points matter, money matters very little. And so it creates this really interesting thing where you are, you don't want to go bankrupt, because then you can't win the game. But... Uh, because money doesn't really matter all that much at the end of the game, you really want to spend as much as possible. You want to go deeply in debt. You just don't want to be the first player or, or among the first players to go bankrupt. Um, so I really, really like that aspect of the game, that, that you essentially don't have to care about money at the end of the game um, as long as you're not the player to go bankrupt. That's Ponzi Scheme. Goo Gong is one that I played at Geekway Mini a few months ago. Actually, quite a few months ago, January now. And Goo Gong, it's a, it has a really, really cool mechanism in the game. You can watch my video for it elsewhere. But the, uh, the eligibility requirement is that one of the actions you can take in the game is to move uh, a meeple representing your, your, uh, your people, your group, your faction, up on a temple, up on the emperor's temple, to reach the top of the temple to present yourself to the emperor. Um, and if you, at the end of the game, if you have not ascended that temple you cannot win the game. You are not eligible to score at the end of the game. Um, and so, and, and also, if you are the first to reach the top of the temple, you get more points. So there's, a, there's an incentive to do that early in the game, which I think is really key in games like that, that have uh, a, a tiered process that moves you towards becoming eligible for the end of the game, that there is a reason to, to start working on that early in the game um, and perhaps be the first player to get there. Uh, and so I like that Gugon does that. I, I like that it gives you that this thing um, to, to focus on and to a little bit of a race between you and the other players uh, to get up to the, the top of that, uh, that, that uh, emperor track or the, the temple track. That's Gugong. Um, Brides and Brides. Brides. Brides and Brides is one that I have not played, but someone recommended it on Twitter in terms of, uh, of this mechanism. In Brides and Bribes, you must be married at the end of the game, or I think one of your characters must be married at the end of the game for you to be eligible for the uh, the, the for the win. And uh, I, I like this thematically in a game about brides and bribes. I, I, I again, I don't know a ton about it, but um, but it, it's interesting to me that that there's a mechanism that encourages you to get married. The game wants you to get married, and if you don't do it, you are not eligible for the end of the game. Um, and this is, this is kind of a, a common theme throughout all these games that I'm talking about, that it's almost as if the designer said, okay, there's one thing that I really want players to do. Thematically, this is important for players to do, um, thematically and maybe mechanically too. And so I'm going to require that players do it. I'm not going to tell them exactly when they have to do it. Just by the end of the game, they need to do this thing. Um, so there's that type of game, and then there's the ones like QE and High Society that say, we, we don't want you to do this thing. So they are... But at the same time, they're still encouraging you to pay attention to, to the money, um, which is what QE and High Society are doing. So I like that, that this is a really interesting element of design that I, I don't think I've actually explored all that much. There are certainly places in my games where I strongly encourage players to do something. But like looking at viticulture, it's something if I really wanted players to make wine. Um, and I do. This is, As I was reading over this list, I was looking at viticulture and thinking, like that, that is, I, I want players to make wine, maybe not only wine. I want them to do a variety of things. There are many ways to achieve victory in, in viticulture, and I like that. But um, I almost wish a little bit I had said, okay, you are not eligible uh, for the win at the end of the game if you have not actually made and sold, made and completed a wine order. Uh, you need to have done that, or no one, no one actually considers you a real winery or a real vineyard. 
so I, I don't know if I, I could have done that as like one extra rule to remember, but um, I like that, that these games, uh, these designers have found a way to, uh, to, to encourage players to do something thematically in a game where they could have otherwise just ignored it. A uh, Clank, okay, I, I'm sorry for the lack of visuals today, but Clank is one that I obviously do have. I've talked about Clank many times. Um, in Clank, the, the requirement, so in Clank you can die. It is possible to run out of health, but dying doesn't actually uh, end your chances at winning. There is, uh, you're, you're dungeon crawling in Clank, you're, you're moving down into this, into this dungeon, and there's a line, let's see, yeah, I can show you here, that... So I, I, ideally in Clank, you would actually get out of the dungeon. So you'd race down in the dungeon, you'd collect some stuff, and then you'd get back out. Up here, you'd get back, uh, yeah, right up here, you'd get back out. However, see this strong green line here? Um, if you get up here and then you die, or then the game ends uh, due to dragon doing stuff, uh, you are still el eligible for the win. Um, the, I think the game thematically says that the, the townspeople come and rescue you because you've made it out of the dungeon. They, they run into this building, they grab you, they pull you out, and then maybe they revive you as well so that you can survive to, uh, to enjoy the victory. But if you are not above ground, if you're down here in the dungeon when you die, even if you have the most points, the most coins in the game, you are not eligible for the win. Um, so I really, I, that creates a really, really fun aspect of the game because it means that even if you're not the first player or a player to get out of the dungeon, you still have a reason to not just hang around in the in the dungeon part itself. You have a reason to, to get out and get above ground at the end of the game. Um, it gives meaning to your choices at the end of the game even when you don't have a chance of getting out. So I really like that about Clank. That, that, uh, that, that backup and that... Uh, that eligibility requirement that you need to be above ground to be eligible for the win um, at the end of the game, even if you're alive or dead. Uh, what's next? We have Tribune. Tribune is a, it's kind of a classic game uh, with a, you're playing cards, a lot of different mini games, and every player has uh, victory conditions, different uh, uh, an array of victory conditions depending on the game, and. At the when when one player has accomplished a certain quantity of victory conditions, uh, you finish that round, and the only players who are eligible for the win at that point are those who have also accomplished their victory conditions. This one was right on the line. I wasn't sure if I should consider this because it is essentially just saying this is a game with these conditions that you have to meet to win. But it is fairly common in Tribune for more than one player to meet those conditions in the same round. So I like that the game um, gives you that goal. You have these goals to accomplish. Um, and if you don't accomplish them, you just aren't eligible for the win. There's no points that you're getting um, instead of meeting those conditions. It's either meet them or don't meet them. Um, and if multiple players meet them, then you look at points. That's Tribune. Um, Escape Plan is one that I have not played. I, this is a, a Vlada Shavadal game. No, no, I'm sorry, not Vlada. It's... Uh, I'm misstating the the, the uh, designer here. I will have to look it up while I'm talking here. So in Escape Plan, you are thieves that uh, that are trying to to steal a bunch of money and then get out of the city. And if you don't get out of the city, I'm so embarrassed that I'm forgetting this design, designer's name. Um, if you don't get out of the city, you are not eligible to win. So that's the eligibility requirement in this. Vital Asserta. I'm sorry, Vital. Yeah, so, um, so not only are you trying to get the most money in this game, but if you don't es actually escape, the theme of the game is es escape plan. If you don't actually escape the city with that money, then you're not eligible to win. So a little similar to Clank there, where you're doing some stuff in a certain spatial element and then getting out of that spatial element um, or, or getting to a certain place in that spatial element to be eligible for the win. Uh, two more here. This, I have one. Okay, so the, the the last one that was on my original list was Australia. So in Australia, it has a weird little hook. I almost didn't include this on this list, in that it is possible for all players to lose because the the bad guys. I'll call them Cthulhu. I can't remember what they're called. The old ones, old ones. I think um, they join the victory track at a certain point in the game, and it's possible for them to just have more points for, than you at the end of the game. They join the time track and then they get, they score at the end of the game. So it, it's possible if players don't defeat the old ones for the old ones to just win the game. And so this is a weird little uh, 
twist on on this game, and there are probably other there are other games that have this little bit of semi cooperative element where it's encouraging all players to fight against the old ones and not just completely ignore them. Because if players don't do that, uh, the old ones are just going to win, um, making all the players ineligible for the victory, even if they have the most points. So I thought this is a nice twist too. This is a whole category here. You can, I'm sure you can name some other examples in the comments. But I like that the game gives players in a competitive game a, a rallying reason, a reason to rally together against some common force because if they don't, all players are going to lose the game. And in some games, this doesn't work well because if you feel like you were falling behind in the game, you might just be like, okay, I don't care. I'll let the old ones win. But uh, the incentive is strong in this game to actually defeat the old ones. You get a bunch of points from doing it. So it's also a catch-up mechanism. If other players are ignoring the old ones, you can be the one to save everybody and you get a bunch of points from doing it, which I think makes that work really well. The 11th hour edition of this list that I thought of as I was uh, trying to think of any cooperative games that do this is Dead of Winter. Dead of Winners, my favorite mechanism in Dead of Winter is that um, the group has a shared goal that they're trying to accomplish, but each player has their own individual goal as well that they need to accomplish. And so even if the group goal is met, if you have not, if all players have not met their individual goals, they are not eligible for the win. Um, so I like that. I, I really like this in, in Dead of Winter because it, it gives you an individual private thing to focus on. It gives the group something to focus on. And it also has that, that feeling of uh, like all players can't really be trusted because all players are doing things that are a little weird that might contradict with the group's goals just so they can make sure they meet their own goal. Um, so I really, really like that, that push and pull there. And this ties into some of the stuff I want to talk about. So that's my the 11 games. I ended up talking about 11 games. Um, and then the, the other two things that I wanted to discuss here are, are why games do this. Why games use these eligibility requirements and how they use it and uh, why I'm fascinated by it. And one of the reasons I think games do this is that it gives players something to focus on in games where there are a lot of different things to care about. Uh, not all of them do this. Obviously, like QE and high society, it's more like a balancing factor um, to prevent players from going too crazy with their, their money. But with these other games, like Gugong, there's a lot going on in Gugong, but... Uh, Early on in the game, if you're trying to figure out something to do, you might just look at that Emperor track and be like, okay, I know at some point I have to do this. I'll just give that a try. I'll give that a try and see how it goes and, and try it for a few turns or even just one turn to, to see how it feels. So it gives players something to focus on, which I think is really, really important in games, especially when you're learning a game. The other big reason is theme. Um, kind of like what I mentioned with Viticulture. The designers for all these games clearly said, okay, thematically, I want players to do this, or I don't want them to do this, uh, and so I'm going to require it. I'm going to make this a requirement in the game. I'm going to say that it's that important. I'm not just giving you a lot of points if you do it or if you don't do it. I'm going to say you have to do it to, to be eligible for the win, which I think is really, really clever. Um, the last thing that I really like about this is the, the push and pull between winning and being eligible. Because in many times in these games, they are conflicting elements of the game. Like in QE, I could just spend a ton of money um, and, and win every auction. I could do that. I could spend billions of dollars and just win every auction. But if I do that, I'm just not eligible for the win. So I like that... Uh, it creates this this really tough decision. Do, how much money do I spend um, so I can win some auctions and get the points that I need to win versus uh, not spending so much money that I'm not eligible for the win? Um, it has to feel a little bit of, of push-your-luck games, like in Deep Sea Adventure when you're diving into the water. Um, the further you dive, the better the chance you have of getting a great treasure, but also the greater chance you have of not even getting back up to the surface and not being able to carry any treasures back to the surface. So I, I, I love that push and pull element. Like how far do I push myself um, to get the thing that I want despite uh, that push itself conflicting with my ability to be eligible to gain anything, to be eligible for the win, to get those treasures. I love that push and pull in games in general, and I think it works really, really well with these eligibility requirements. I'm sure there are games that I left off the list today. I would love to hear your examples in the comments or your thoughts on um, what works about this mechanism, what doesn't work about this mecha mechanism, um, and, and other games that you'd like to see it in, and other games where you think it could be implemented, other existing games where it could be implemented and, uh, and maybe strengthen the game by doing so.
yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Thanks for joining me for today's Sunday sit down, and I will see you on Tuesday with my favorite game mechanism video. Take care.